It's my pleasure to bring out six of the members of the cast and crew of the Box Trolls, all of whom you just saw in that film, beginning with the president and CEO of the company that made the film, Leica, as well as the lead animator on the Box Trolls. Please welcome Travis Knight. We also have both directors of the film, Anthony Stocky and Graham Annable. And then from the cast, you know him as Bran Stark. From Game of Thrones, in the lead character of Eggs, please welcome Isaac Hempstead Wright. Hi, Isaac. From movies like Maleficent and Super 8, playing Winifred Portly Rhine, please welcome Elle Fanning. with very cool yellow eyeliner, I just want to add. <laughs> and finally, I want to introduce a man who, in a 30-plus year film career, has won an Oscar, has starred in movies like Gandhi, Bugsy, Sexy Beast, Iron Man 3. I thought you'd like that one. But one thing he's never done is come to Comic-Con. Until now, playing Archibald Snatcher, Sir Ben Kingsley. It was so fun to hear all of you in the crowd respond to that piece of film, particularly when all of the cast members were, were to appear on screen, the ones that are here and then the ones that aren't. I'm, and I'm super excited for you all to see this. Uh, Travis, I want to start with you. This is based on a book by Alan Snow that came out 10 years ago called Here Be Monsters. What about that book struck your interest and led you to believe that there was a film for Leica in it? We, uh, we started working on Here Be Monsters almost 10 years ago. It was, a, it was a book written by Alan Snow, and it had these kind of whispers of this classic literature, the kind of stuff that I grew up loving, things like, you know, Roald Dahl. It had, uh, you know, bits of kind of Monty Python entwined in it, and Charles Dickens, that sort of thing. We started developing, actually, the same time that we were working on Coraline. And so, thank you. Uh, and so uh, it, it took us nearly 10 years to get the thing to the screen. It's this 500-page book. It's like a phone book. We somehow had to distill the essence of that down to a 90-minute movie. And so this guy wasn't the most efficient guy in, in, in turning it down. So it took us nearly 10 years. Very but, patient boss. Yeah. But uh, in the end, I think we have something that's really beautiful. It's a, it's a poignant, moving story about what makes a family set against this incredible Victorian backdrop that, that explores bigotry and corruption. It's a, it's a beautiful story. Tony, one thing that I found interesting about this is that it's a mixture of stop motion animation, which you guys did, of course, with Coraline and Paranorman, but also combined with CGI uh, as well. How, does those, how do those two things work together? And what's the precedent for that, if at all, in Leica and also in just in animation in general? Well, uh, the history of stop motion is, is uh, the history of cinema. You know, from the earliest days, uh, George Millais, uh, through King Kong, and Ray Harryhausen, uh, to uh, Luke on the Tauntaun and the Rocketeer, it's stop motion has been part of cinema. And I think, you know, Travis can talk a little bit about it, that the raison d'etre of Leica is to pull stop motion into the modern world. So they bring to bear all the latest technologies to which is a classic animation technique. So with the rapid prototype faces and, and other stuff, it, uh, it definitely looks like no stop motion you've ever seen before. Um, and at the same time, this film uh, is probably more so a hybrid than any other film that Like has made. Um, it, with each successive film, they've incorporated more and more um, technology into the process. Um, in this film, there's probably no single shot that doesn't have some sort of CG accompaniment with it, whether it's extending the set or more atmosphere or crowd extensions and stuff. And I think part of the appeal of the book was that you look for these serendipitous moments where the studio is in a perfect place and the project comes along in a perfect place. The scope of the book allowed Leica to use every trick they had in their bag, plus add a few more. I'm gonna talk uh, about the human characters in a bit. 
and the human characters that think that they're trolls. But I first want to ask about the trolls themselves. Graham, what do you think it is that makes the box troll characters, and we saw a bit of them in the film, so interesting and lovable? Uh, well, for me, <laughs> they don't talk. I don't like to talk a lot, and they didn't talk a lot. I got an opportunity. I was uh, finishing up storyboarding on Paranorman, and there was a bit of a lull for production for the story department, and I got an opportunity to help Tony out. He was still wrestling the whole Here Be Monsters book down, uh, and I got a chance to storyboard a sequence, which didn't end up in the film, but it was a, it was a moment when the uh, box trolls find a baby in the trash. And as a storyboard artist, it was like, my dream come true in terms of a sequence to work with because, again, these guys just gurgle any emote with little sounds. Everything's through the acting and, and the compositions, and, and I got to work this whole sequence out without any actual dialogue. Um, and it was one of those moments that just kind of clicked for Tony and Travis for what they wanted to see out of the film, and uh, that's what kind of got me rolling on the project. Perhaps the most out-of-the-box bit of casting in this film is Sir Ben as Snatcher. Travis, because he's not exactly known for voice work, film animation work. What made you think of him? Uh, sexy beast. <laughs> <Not Logan. laughs> no, 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 no. We, wa we wanted to, I mean, Snatcher is, is designed to be one of the greatest all-time animated villains. And so he's got, he's got to have that, that sense of malevolence. He's got to be, you know, very intimidating. And yet at the same time, there's, the, it's, it's, there's sort of a degree of vulnerability there. There's a humanity there. And so we needed someone who could bring all those sorts of things to bear, who could, who could be intimidating, who could, be, who could have a bit of a soul underneath it all, and, and, uh, and, and bring some comedy as well. And, you know, we thought there was absolutely no chance that we would get Ben Kingsley. <laughs> and when he said yes, it was like we, we celebrated throughout the studio. <laughs> Have you been asked to do much voice work or animation work over the years? Uh, no, I think this is my third, only my third or fourth in all the years. I loved it. It was very liberating uh, just to depend upon my voice uh, to bring this extraordinary creature to life. <laughs> I did most of my recordings um, lying down, reclining on a, on a kind of sofa bed because I wanted his voice to come from his belly, not from where my voice normally comes from. So it was a very relaxed recording session. <laughs> <laughs> and I did nod off occasionally. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, just to allow the voice to, to come from a different place, really. I mean, a word that I would use to describe him is unctuous. You know, I mean, he, and it's, that's helped along by the horrible teeth that he has and this big old belly. But what did you do with your performance and your voice to make him that quality? I think that anyone who is constantly passed over by life, who feels somewhat ignored, who feels somewhat pushed into a corner by fate, is very vulnerable. I think he is hugely socially ambitious, and his, his ambitions are never quite fulfilled, so he has to invent a whole world that he can conquer in order to um, empower himself. So I think my starting point was a kind of longing, a kind of yearning I inside him. And then it's, of course, covered up by the bravura, the narcissism, the, the voice. So I, I always like to find the little crack that makes a character vulnerable and build on that. It does seem like between Iron Man 3, that whole Mandarin and the great switcheroo that that character made, and now this film, which even though he is a vulnerable character, it's also really fun and funny, your performance. It seems like you're having a lot of fun in this point in your career. Is that a goal? Um, I, I used to do a lot of comedy on stage when I first started acting. And I was given quite a lot of, um, not awards, but lots of nominations for my comedy performances. And it's something that I love doing. I love making people laugh. I, it's a lovely way of uh, communicating and joining in. It's joyful, it's releasing. So I, I hopefully will do more comedy now, again. That'd be great. <coughs> Miss L, <laughs> as people may remember, the actress who did the lead voice in Coraline was none other than your sister Dakota. So what conversations, if any, did you have with her as you were deciding to do a film with Laika? Yeah, I remember when she was um, 
you know, doing the voice for Coraline. I was really little, but then it, she did that um, over, I think, like an eight-year span, or maybe it, it, a little less, but it took about that time because she kept going back, and they were really, you know, perfecting the voice, and, and obviously it takes so long to do the puppets, and that was their first one, so um, it, that was, she was so excited, and I went with her down to um, Portland and looked at all the Coraline stuff, um, when I was really small and I looked at all the puppets and, ha and the worlds that they created, they were all like little dollhouse. And so I remember going there and how much fun I had when I, was, when I was young. And then for them to ask me to do one and for me to go back down and look at the movie that I did and see all the little boxes and how they have this one lady who is like special where she knits teeny little sweaters like, and she just like a small little knitter, you know, for the, for, <laughs> for anything. I think they were knitting some scarves for like the mice and Coraline or something like that. They were like this small. She just sits there and goes like this. Like everything is so, it's unbelievable. It's the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen in my life going down there. Mm. It's just a whole nother world. <laughs> Obviously you've done a British accent before. Is that fun for you to do? Do you get nervous when you have to incorporate that? Yeah, it is, especially, you know, Y'all are British, so <laughs> I'm not. So um, I did. Uh, I wanted to make sure that it was right, but I had a dialect coach that was there. So I remember I'd be there, and Tony would be like, "All right, that's great, move on." And then the dialect coach would be like, "Nope, nope, nope, that word wasn't right." So then we'd have to do it again and perfect it. Um, but it was nice to, because everything was in the voice. So I worked extra hard on the accent just because, you know, you're your facial expressions, nothing can mask it because your voice is out there and that's the only thing that everyone hears. You know, you can't look in your eyes or be distracted by something else. It's, it's what you say. <laughs> Isaac, how are you doing? Fine, thank you. <laughs> look who's two seats over from you, Sir Ben Kingsley. <laughs> we all had dinner last night and we were very excited to be at, sitting at the table because you guys don't really get to know each other that well, you had a couple recording sessions together, yeah. but for the most part, you, yeah. were, you were on your own. So yeah. it's, it's fun to see how in awe of your cast members you are. It's really great. One thing that I love is that people who follow Game of Thrones know, because your character is paralyzed, you have really just your face. It's all you can use in that performance. With this character of Eggs, you only had your voice. Was there a, a particular challenge or fun in doing that? I mean, yeah, Bran is kind of limited in terms of he's, he's paralyzed, but I don't think paralysis is sort of a, um, it, it doesn't limit how you express yourself in any way. I don't, it's not like you've just got your voice or, or, or your face. You've, you've got the whole body and, and you know, otherwise, otherwise you'd, yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I guess you, as, as Al said, you have, you have only got the voice, you haven't got the, the whole face expression. Well, one thing that's cool is I understand that you were the first person to come on to this film. So I don't know if that's one of the reasons why I feel like you and Eggs really do look alike, or if that's more of a coincidence. It was more of a coincidence. There was, there's an old movie, a Ken Loach movie called Kez, that had a little boy in it that I always thought had the qualities that, uh, that uh, Eggs would have. So we used him as a reference as we began to design the character. And then we saw, you know, Isaac on, on uh, Game of Thrones, and I mean, we liked his voice, but it was also startling how much he resembled that kid. All right. <laughs> One thing that's fun is that, you know, a lot of the work that the three of you from the cast do is not just words, it's a lot of grunts and noises and stuff like that. We see one moment where your character, where Eggs is kind of kissing on a woman's uh, arm and kind of slurping her arm. Is that you doing the kiss yes. and the slurp? Yeah, no, I remember at the end of each session, we'd do these things called Vox vocalizations, and we'd spend the last 20 minutes of every session just screaming or yeah. shouting or, or jumping off. Things. Or licking. Or licking. Yeah. <laughs> what about the two of you? Did you have to do all that too? I mean, Ellie, yes. you, you have a couple of errs and oh, and wheels. There's one time where I'm about to say something and then someone puts their hand over my mouth and so I had to do that myself I had to be like Ugh, and I go like that to myself um, just to you know you have to get your body involved even though it's just your voice you know you're still you're not just standing there you're like <laughs> doing stuff you know right. um, and yeah any like anything else you try to incorporate your body to make the best sound <laughs> and there's one crazy sequence that we saw a little bit of in the reel where 
Snatcher eats some cheese and he has this insane, severe allergic reaction to the cheese. How did you decide to play that? Were you laying down on that part too? I got my stunt double to do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, I squashed, I squished my cheeks up and uh, made my mouth as tiny as possible and squeezed the wood so that it would come out all the time. What's with all the cheese in the movie? Cheese is like a character in this movie. That, uh, that's an obsession of Alan Snow's. Yeah. Cheese is a big element in the book, uh, too. It's even a bigger element in the book. We toned it down a little bit. He had live cheeses running around in the wilds around cheese bridge <laughs> in the book, which was even a little too weird Yeah, for we'd us. already hit our public <laughs> count at that yeah, point. Yeah. Through the line of the rambling cheese. It's just a symbol for anything that kind of right. the, the, uh, the aristocracy uh, right, values tremendously and the kind of the lower classes look up to. It, it's, it's an absurd thing, which again calls out how absurd that whole idea is. Yes. Right. Could be a fine wine or mm -hmm. money even. Yeah. There's one sequence in this movie that I just absolutely adore, which is a sequence that we're actually going to show you right now, um, where we kind of learn about the box trolls and their world. And what I love about it is that it's basically completely dialogue free. And because of that, it's really hypnotic. Do you want to set it up a little bit and tell the crowd what they're about to see? So box trolls, I mean, as I think you saw from the earlier thing, are these timid creatures that live beneath the streets of Cheesebridge. But at this point in the film, what most people believe, which is usually lies that have been spread by Mr. Snatcher, yeah. is that box trolls are not these timid tinkerers and dumpster diving creatures that come out at night. They're in fact these evil creatures that come above ground to steal um, anything that's not bolted down or to steal your babies, or in fact, to steal something which is even more important, your fine cheeses. <laughs> so this is the point in the movie where the audience begins to realize, hopefully, that box trolls are not what they've been made out to be by the pest exterminator, Archibald Snatcher. Okay, so I have a few questions about that. Was that actually a baby's voice, or was that an adult pretending to be a baby? That, that was a four-year-old who's good at playing a baby. I'll say. <laughs> Max <laughs> Mitchell. He also had hiccups to yeah. record Yeah. You, uh, Tony did most of the voice sessions for the majority of the project, but the, the one voice assignment I got to do was to go down to LA and do baby eggs. Uh, and for me, it was the first time even dealing with directing a voice session. And uh, Max Mitchell had the hiccups that morning. So uh, <laughs> you hear a little hiccup. Yeah, it was, it was a little extra stressful for me that day, but uh, it ended up working into a lot of his lines because it was just a great thing. I, I don't know if folks notice, but when you first see Baby Eggs come out there, he does a little hiccup in there. It just turned into a charming moment. And then we see that uh, what the box trolls do instead of, if they like something, instead of applauding, they, they tap their boxes. Where did that come from? Is that from the book or is that something you guys came up with? Something we came up with. Yeah. You know, when we developed the project with the uh, storyboard department, we're always looking for moments uh, with the storyboard artists and with the animators to come up with um, ideas for behaviors, you know, nonverbal behaviors and stuff that are, uh, that can come up at any moment. I'm curious as to, once a film like this is done, because everything is created and the little sweaters are knitted and all that, where does all this stuff go after the movie's over? And then for the three cast members, what's the one thing that you want uh, oh. from, <laughs> from the production? This well is your chance to ask. Well. First, what happens to it all? Unfortunately, a lot of it ends up getting destroyed in the making of the movie. So the idea is that because, you know, we, we build these massive sets where the animators have to animate on, and then as the camera pushes in on various points in the sequence to get you know closer for medium close-ups and close-ups, we actually have to carve the set away to get closer so the animator can actually get in there and move the puppet around. And so what starts out as this big, massive, beautiful set by the end of a sequence, you know, maybe a year later, there's very little that remains because it has to get chopped up. So the stuff that we do save, we hold on to, things that, are, that haven't been destroyed in the process, some of that stuff we send out to museums, uh, but, but most of it ends up getting destroyed in the making of the film. All right, what do the three of you want? <laughs> As your keepsake. Yeah, I want the mecha drill. You want the mecha <laughs> It's the biggest character in the film. It's five feet tall and weighs a ton. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. That's hard. I would love some of the, the cheeses, some of the cheese spread that I saw um, on this table. In the ballroom set, there's a ballroom scene, and that's so beautiful, and all the dresses swish on the ladies. Um, yeah, I would love a Winnie puppet. <laughs> Very sweet, yeah. Sir Ben? I would like the puppet of Snatcher 
to um, open my front door and greet my guests as they arrive. <laughs> <laughs> so which of those three are possible, guys? I'm going to defer to Travis. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I mean, unless he wants to wait for an animator to animate that puppet meeting his guests, he might have to wait. That would take a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I would advise against that. All right, I'm about to open it up to uh, the audience, so if anyone has questions, please line up at the mic. And also, I want to take a cue from my buddy Anthony Bresnikan from the Gibber panel the other day and say if you're shy and you have a question, you are welcome to uh, tweet me at Dave Carger and I will look at some tweets. If you don't want to actually come up to the microphone, I'll do that too. But before I do, I want to ask about Tracy Morgan because we saw him in the, the film clip. And um, how did you guys find him and, and how did he fit into this cast of mostly British when, actors? When, when we first recorded him, um, he used his normal voice, but insisted that he'd been studying an English dialect for a long time. Um, and he said, how do you like my English? How do you like my English accent? Over and over again. Um, he couldn't believe that he was in a movie with Sir Ben. Yeah. Uh, he kept, I'm in a movie with Sir Ben. He kept saying that and I said, okay, can we record now? <laughs> his character was initially um, conceived of as like a, a, a quick guest appearance. And he was only supposed to repeat over and over the words, very nice, very nice, very nice. And we recorded that and it was very funny. But the stuff that he added to it, ad-libs that he made, made us not want to limit the character yeah. to just those four words. So yeah. we, we started to write for him a lot more, and he brought a lot to it. Yeah, he um, ended up inventing a lot of that, who that character became. He's like this diminutive uh, Victorian Terminator. And yep. uh, you know, he brought a lot of the, the things that ended up incorporating into the character, you know, in the kind of ad-libbing that stuff during the vocal sessions. Yeah, and he has, a, he's, has this weird idiosyncrasy where he narrates exactly what he's doing. So he'll say, I'm flying on a cage when he's flying on a cage. I'm swinging on a chain when I'm swinging on a chain. He goes, we burrowed into the earth and stuff. Yeah, he's very clever. I love it. And, and the crowd was also quite excited to see Richard Ayoade and Nick Frost and Simon Pegg and all these great people that are in the cast too. So you're gonna, you guys are going to charge out of that. Okay, let's go to the audience. Hi, what is your question? Hi, my name is Joel. Um, big fan of everybody on that table. Uh, thanks for everything. Um, my question is for the actors, um, what was your favorite scene to do? Um, for me, well, my character, she was definitely, she's a little spoiled, a little bratty, um, and that was, that was very fun to do. I, I, when my character first goes down into the box troll cave, um, she's very surprised because of how scared they are, and she's like, really angry because she's also obsessed with kind of gross, grotesque things. And so she's like, where's all the blood? And she's like screaming and all the box trolls are all scared of her because she's <laughs> so loud. Um, and that was my favorite to do because I got to, to be, you know, project my voice and, you know, say, you know, all these rivers of blood and bones and talk about that. That was, that was fun for me. <laughs> How about the guys? I think actually I'd have to go with that one too, just because I quite like doing some of the comedic stuff with eggs, doing some, you know, funny stuff rather than the sort of more serious bits. So with that, when, when, when he's saying, uh, well, you don't fit in your box, he's like, oh, well, I'm long boned or, or your ears are funny. I slept on them funny. Um, that was fun to do. I think for me, when I met her dad, when I meet the mayor, uh, he's at his most ambitious and he's most vulnerable. Um, and I enjoyed the delicious tones that I could explore trying to wheedle my way into high society. I, I love that scene. Thanks for the question. Hi. Hi. Um, I really love stop motion animation, so your company, I love that it's out there. And I was just wondering, when you have films that take 10 years, how did <laughs> your production company come into being and how have you been able to keep it going with your films? Well, I mean, when, when we say it took 10 years, that's it, you're, we're talking about the actual development of a project, which, I mean, the pace of production on a stop motion film is glacial. It takes forever to make one of these things. I mean, we churn out maybe at our peak a minute to two minutes a week of footage. The actual time where we're shooting is about a year and a half. The development time be at the beginning is, you know, it's probably just a couple of people just f figuring out how to, how to make the story work. And then we start bringing in designers and, and illustrators to figure out the world and what the characters look like. But one of the things that's interesting about Leica is how we combine the kind of the, the old school handcrafted, you know, art of stop motion with technology. And so, you know, for instance, we'll make a road out of stuff like kitty litter, or we'll make a, a puppet's hair out of, you know, natural organic materials, things like raffia or hemp, 
Uh, we had a lot of hemp around the studio. <laughs> they told me it was hemp. for the hair. Yeah. <laughs> but, but then on the other end, we have high-tech stuff, this crazy Buck Rogers technology where we can actually model something in a computer and then print it out as something you can hold in your hand. It's not something that should exist. It's very unsettling. Magic. It's, we, we print in plastics and powder, but you can print in rubber, you can print in metal. I've heard you can print in meat. Uh, think about that for a second. Printing in, in meat and metal, that's the stuff of nightmares. I mean, that's when the machines rise up against us, that's what they're going to use to build their vast cybernetic armies. And the streets will be littered with human remains. So in the meantime, we're just going to use it to, uh, to make cartoons. <laughs> for the family. For the family. For the, for the, for the kids. For the children's. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned that a lot of set pieces or puppets will get destroyed during um, animation. I was wondering what some of the other um, challenges of stop motion can be. It's horrible. <laughs> it's, it's the worst way to make a movie. It makes no sense. Look it's at so my face. So, so I'm stupid. only 20 years old. Look at that face. <laughs> It's painful. I mean, you're contorting your body, you're burning your fingers, you're cutting your hand. It's awful. There's no reason why we should do this thing. And yet, on the other hand, it's, be it's beautiful. To me, it's the most stunning way of film. It's the most beautiful way that you can experience a film because everything has intent. Everything comes from the mind and the hands of an artist. Every single thing is designed, built, and manipulated by artists' hands. It combines everything I love, photography and design and sculpting and lighting and painting and, and, and acting and music. It's just an incredible art form that is so rare, but it's also incredibly beautiful. So it's, it's worth the pain. Elle, we talked about the fact that Dakota did uh, the voice of Coraline. Josh Bonacore out there from Twitter wants to know, did Dakota give you any advice to help you prepare for doing this voice work, and was it helpful advice? She didn't give me any, because I, I hadn't done much voice. I'd never done really an animated film. I did My Neighbor Totoro when I was four. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't, I, don't, um, I don't remember that so much. I don't, but um, yeah, so this was going into it completely new. I think with me and my sister, we, we are very kind of separate in our work ways. So it, she was very excited that I was going to get to this. She was she just said, you're just going to have the best time. You're going to have so much fun. So she was happy for me. But, you know, she let me do my own thing and create my own character. She has Coraline and I have Winnie. So that's nice. great. Yeah. Hi, what's your question? Uh, my question is, uh, how does this movie compare to movies that you're going to do in the future? Mm. <laughs> uh, does that, are you going to go see this movie, or are you waiting for the next one? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm going to see the movie or not. <laughs> that, that's outrageous. How dare you? Get him off the mic. Take him away. Bring him up here. <laughs> My sister may force me, but... Oh. <laughs> Can we, can we talk to your sister? Yeah, where's she your here? sister? She's all the way back at her hotel. She really? She didn't even come, huh? Yeah. You guys are a tough family. I, I came here with me and my dad and my friend, so technically, uh... Okay, that came out. Anyways, uh, that's my question. That's a great question. I, we're, we're really, we're feeling the love up here. That's yeah, wonderful. Thank, thank you lot. for that. Great. No, the Comic Box Souls is... Again next year. Yeah, right. The Box Souls is super awesome. You should absolutely go see it. Our next film is even going to be more awesome. <laughs> <laughs> even your sister will want to see it, and your yeah, friends, your and your dad. Yep. <laughs> thank you. Okay, now leave the hall. Leave the hall. <laughs> Hi. Hello. What's your uh, question? Yes, I was just wondering, between Coraline and Paranorman in this film, there's sort of a darker, more twisted sense of humor in your stuff than in other animated fair. And I was just wondering what drew you to that type of uh, storytelling approach? Well, I think our perspective is that, you know, we're drawn to the kind of stories that we love, the kind of things that we grew up watching and loving and then end up kind of shaping who we are. And I think that the best kind of storytelling is dynamic storytelling. It has a balance of intensity and warmth and darkness and light. And I think, unfortunately, not just in animation, but in filmmaking generally these days, that is missing in large measure. And it's something that we feel is important to telling a good and powerful story. And so while I think we want to make something different every time out that doesn't look like what we've done before, we also have elements of that in our DNA where we're always going to tell those kinds of stories that have that kind of balance. Thank you. 
Hi, Supreme Witch. <laughs> Why, yes. Uh, it's really wonderful to address all of you, especially Sir Ben Kingsley. You've been an inspiration to me as a performer since I was a child, so thank you for being here. Um, well, I, what I'm interested in uh, from the actors in that you've had so much experience doing, you know, live work with your bodies and now this totally different experience. Do you find it more limiting or more freeing to work with just your voice? I find it more freeing. Um, it, it's, you can't, you, the, the beautiful puppetry takes the human form beyond its known limits and the, the, the great thrill is that one is allowed to take one's voice beyond its usual limits too. So I found it very exciting and very freeing. How about the other two? Uh, I, yeah, that's, that's a good point. I think you, you can really go all out with it, whereas in live action it's kind of, it's not actually that big a part of the final performance. It's only a, a small fraction that makes up the final performance. So yeah, it's, it's great to just be able to sort of go 100% with just the voice. Yeah, with your voice, you can kind of get out of the box. Hey. Oh. I knew it was coming sometime. Uh, yeah, and try new things, I think. Um, and no one can really, you know, it's not, there are no other actors around you where, you know, with this, it's you're just going line by line. So you can really just do that line as many times as you'd like to perfect it. And, um, and to me, I, I'm really into all the details, so I, um, I love the all the specifics of it, yeah. There's a purity to it. It's incredibly difficult, I think, uh, to, to, to get a great vocal performance. Uh, so many actors can use their body and their faces. In animation, they can only use their voice. And so I think f there are few actors, actually, that can just hone all their, their talent down to that one instrument. And uh, we were fortunate in everything that we've done that we've gotten extraordinary actors who can do that. Is it harder, guys, on the days where, I mean, obviously on the days where you're by yourself in the studio, you have someone reading the other lines, I would imagine, but is it harder when you're the only cast member there? Do you feel more self-conscious in a way that there's no other actor to play off of? I'm still a little bit worried by Elle's phrase, there were no other actors around. <laughs> <laughs> I quite like actors, actually. No, me too. Oh, they're nice people. Uh, no, it, it is actually rather good to imagine what you're playing off rather than have it there. I'm very dependent upon the other actor when I'm working, and so much of my performance is defined by the other. And um, only on one tiny occasion did I have the joy of working with Isaac. All the rest of the time I was on my own. There was no other to provoke me. So that, that was. Um, you really have to push your imagination to the limits. Mm. Hi, what's your question? Hi, my name is Greg, and I have a strong love for uh, Walter Park's work as well as Ray Harryhausen, and I was wondering if there was a coincidence between um, uh, the cheese connection in this movie as the, there is a cheese connection with like Wallace and Gromit. <laughs> They're, they're both English sources, so I think some of the English actors could help us. What is this obsession with yeah, cheese? Yeah, what's with the cheese? What's going on with that? <laughs> Who doesn't love cheese? <laughs> Come on. Cheese is universal. It is. It's one thing we can all agree on. If, if there's one thing that could bring peace to the Middle East, it's more cheese. It's cheese. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Obama. <laughs> I just solved all your problems. <laughs> Hi. So, uh, hello. Um, my name is Carolina. I'm a film student, and I love stop motion animation. I don't think I can do it myself, but <laughs> the, the footage looks incredible. I was just wondering, uh, which program do you guys use uh, to edit the stop motion, and can you talk a little bit about the, the editing process? It the uh, oh here, get uh, well the storyboarding. Uh, you want me to talk? She's asking about the animation. Yeah. Well, but I, I mean, first we storyboard everything in the film, which is where we sort of begin to establish what the performance will be. Mm -hmm. And those boards are edited on the Avid. Um, and then we go, you know, once we've figured out exactly what the timing is going to be and the lines of dialogue are going to be, then we go out to the actors and we record their final pieces of dialogue and we edit those on the Avid because we need to know the exact timing of the dialogue so we can begin the process of preparing the faces for the performance. All of that editing is done uh, on the Avid. And then we have this moment that in stop motion is unlike any other form of animation. 
It's where you launch the animator into their sequence. And stop motion has this ability to combine all the worst aspects of live action filmmaking and animation with none of the benefits of either one of them. <laughs> it puts all the worst parts together. Because in most traditional animation forms and CG animation, you can work on the performance over a long period of time, adding frames to it or removing frames from it. In stop motion, it's very much a performance, much like what the actors do. Um, Travis, you know, when we launch a sequence, we talk about it. He might do a block, which is a rough pass of moving the puppet through the set, um, you know, just a couple of poses. And then there's one rehearsal, which is done not on ones, um, every frame exposed, but on fours or sixes to figure out the movement, and then that's it. And then they have to do the whole sequence in one go. A uh, whole shot. I mean, the technology nowadays is amazing. You can, you can make a movie with basically the same kind of tools that, that, that we used to make the film just by going into a camera shop. We use digital cameras to shoot the movie, a Canon 5D. You can, get, you can go to a camera shop and get that right now. You can download the software that we used to shoot the film, Dragon, right from the internet. It's stuff that exists that anybody who has a Jones for making stop motion, it's all there and the information's out there. Unlike when, you know, when we were younger and it was, we were just you know, nerds in isolation in our parents' basement trying to figure out how it worked. That information exists now, like anyone can do it. This is a good question that I think we should mention. A guy in the audience called The Englishman wants to know if this movie's in 2D or 3D. It's 3D. 3D. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's 3D. For the next film, we're going to use uh, 4D. <laughs> we have an extra D. No, we shot the whole thing. There's some films that they, sh they shoot, uh, they don't shoot natively in 3D. They do that post process, which is ridiculous. Boo! <laughs> but we shoot everything natively in 3D. We design the whole thing to be uh, experienced in that way. We do think it adds another uh, level to it because the, this stuff actually does exist in three-dimensional space, and we, you know, we think it's a nice storytelling tool. But we also have a 2D version for, you know, for other uh, theaters and for home video and that sort of thing. Hi. What's your question? Hi. Um, so Morgan Hay went to STSU and. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I got to hold some of the puppets for, I guess he was having a presentation or something, and um, uh, I got to see the materials for uh, Paranorman that you made, and uh, like the tongues and the wetness, and I was wondering what the happy medium is between stop motion materials and um, the CG. You know, it's really whatever tool makes the most sense. I mean, we're not purists in the sense that every single thing you see on screen has got to be made by hand, but almost all of it is. I mean, we try to get as much capture, capture as much in camera as we can. There's some things that you just can't. Like, we have this big ballroom scene where we have dozens and dozens of dancers. Uh, there was only some of that. You couldn't physically build all those puppets, and so we do some stuff practically, a lot of the core dancers, and then we have you know, what we call digital extras, which are CG puppets that we use to fill out the world. So whatever tool makes the most sense to make the film look as beautiful as it can be. Hi. Hi, my name's Jen. I'm an assistant decorator, and I wonder if you could speak to the difference for doing stop-motion animation and making the sets as opposed to doing live-action set design. It's just smaller. <laughs> I mean, in every way, it's very similar to, to production in, in, uh, in live action. You, it's a real set that you light with the same kind of lights and stuff. It's all just in miniature. Hmm. Oh, I like this question from Kelly. The question is whether the actors ever got to see any of the animation taking place, or was it all kind of compartmentalized? Did you ever get to watch them animate? I we would bring footage to the recording sessions and show you what had been done previously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is often I, when I went down to Oregon, they, um, the animators were on the sets, and they, but they stopped, obviously, and I came in. They were telling me the sequences that they were doing, so they were kind of in between it, but I didn't get to, did, didn't get to watch them in their zone. <laughs> Hi, what's your question? Hi. Um, I'm a writer, and I was a little curious about the script. Uh, for animation, do you add in, like, Sir Ben Kingsley at this point, like, makes a loud gasp or farts or whatever at this point? The script, scripts for animation are usually very fat compared to other scripts because we write a lot of description so that we have it accessible when we go to the recording sessions, and it helps to write down, if you can imagine that at this point you want um, a growl or a grunt or a, or a gasp, it helps to have it in there so that the actor has the context of what that, like Isaac said, that vocalization that we want, which has to sound like this, like a man whose face is swollen, 
we, we write that in the script in a much more descriptive way than you would on your average live action script. But not a fart. This ain't DreamWorks. <laughs> <laughs> Gauntlet from sorry. <laughs> I think I recognize this guy. Hi, what's your question? Hi, um, my name's Rick. I worked on the movie. I yes, did... you did. Hey, Rick. <laughs> yes, you did, Rick. Yes, you did. Um, anyway, I did, I did some 2D animation, facial animation uh, studies for it. But um, I just want to, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to work on the film. It was awesome. Like is an incredible company. Um, so I wanted to thank you for the honor of that. But also I wanted to know if you have um, plans to do use 2D more in your films in the future? Yeah, I mean, we are, uh, I guess, obsessed with bringing back dead art forms to life. Uh, and so 2D is certainly one of those. Uh, we love 2D. 2D has been in every single film that we've made to, to increasing degrees. And so they, I have a long-held ambition to one day do a 2D feature, yes. Whoa. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> Um, okay, with our last few minutes, there's another final piece of film that we can show everybody. This is a great little moment that plays at the end of the movie featuring the Nick Frost and Richard Iowate characters and someone else is in it too. Do you want to set this up, Travis? Don't spoil it, Dave. <laughs> uh, this, was, uh, this is uh, kind of towards the end of the film. We have the, the uh, it's a, kind of a little extra that we put on there. Uh, it's our, our two guys who are waxing philosophical about the meaning of the universe. Is this the first time you starred in one of your own movies? Yes, it was, it was, it was, it was absolutely part of my contract. I demanded to be actually in the film this time. <laughs> so listen, before we all go, uh, we all had an idea involving one of your cast members who obviously could not be here with us today, and that's Tracy Morgan. Yeah, a very dear friend of ours, Tracy Morgan, uh, was recently in a terrible accident. And thankfully, he's home with his family now, and he's recovering. Uh, but I found that there are a few things that are more restorative than love and positive vibes. And being that I've, I've come down to Comic-Con now for five years running, and I've not found a community that is as loving, as giving, as generous as the Comic-Con family. And so if, if you could join me in sending our love out to Tracy for a full and, and, and speedy recovery, uh, a big, we love you, Tracy, thump your chest like a box stroll, uh, on the count of three, that would be wonderful. We're gonna videotape it and send it to him. So here we go. On the count of three, will we love you, Tracy? One, two, three. We love you, Tracy!